Thank you so much for doing this, Idris. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've been absorbing your information and listening to you talk since quite some time now. Some time now, sorry. So I'm so so grateful to, to see you. I'm so, I'm so uh, happy to meet you. The honor's all mine, really. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Let's talk quickly about your book. Unfortunately, for the moment, we won't have it in English, right? Well, hopefully soon enough. But that's true. So far, this is just an essay in French. Yeah, it's a, it's a great book. Uh, I recommend it for everyone who speaks French, or hopefully we will see it in English very, very soon. Really, I'm crossing my fingers there. <laughs> but it, since it was indeed for more of an uh, English-speaking audience, mm -hmm. because the subjects are uh, regarding the, the so-called singularity, mm -hmm. and I actually started writing this book after I spoke at Singularity University mm -hmm. in the United States, where, you know, most uh, people interested in, in transhumanism gather, mm -hmm. And, and the whole point of this essay, of course, is to say that there is a way that, that we may not be replaced by machines, especially on an industrial or e economic basis. And sure enough, it's more made, more written for an English-speaking audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. The triumph of your intelligence, uh, I really recommend it. Uh, yeah, the, the triumph, triumph of the your triumph intelligence. Of, yeah, right, yeah. There's some kind of <laughs> Lenny Riefenstahl vibe there, right? The triumph of <laughs> the true. will. Well, uh, hopefully, again, touch knocking on wood there. I'm not making any mention to that. But the point, of course, is that our intelligence may prevail. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we live in that time where people, even as smart as Elon Musk, are saying that it, it is quite inevitable that, that we end up being replaced by machines in our economic role and maybe even political role, mm -hmm. making decisions for the masses. Um, and the subtitle of the book in, in French, but well, translated to English, is why we won't be mm -hmm. replaced by machines. But in fact, I put why I should have written more uh, how, because mm -hmm. it's more of a wish, right? I explain in the book how it could be possible, how mm -hmm. we could do it. I'm not predicting the future, of course. But the whole point of this essay is to demonstrate which ways could make human beings relevant in all fields mm. um, of society. Oh, well, make complete sense. Uh, quick first question. So, uh, is, is a Terminator type of scenario a myth? Uh, Terminator is two things. There's the artificial intelligence, but also traveling through time. Yes, yeah, true. It's really part mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the scenario. And you know, James Cameron used to be a truck driver. Yeah, true. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of crazy when you think about it. He was just a truck driver and he convinced himself he could be an amazing director, which he became. Yeah, true, and, true. Um, Let's wait for the second av avatar first. Exactly, and then, uh, right. Then <laughs> and um, you also had, uh, of course, um, Harrison Ford, not in Terminator, but Harrison Ford used to be uh, a carpenter, I believe. Yeah, a handyman true. at, uh, yeah, yeah, at yeah, Francis yeah. Ford Coppola's house. Uh, so, well, okay, those two aspects of the dystopia of, of Terminator, three, mm -hmm. even three aspects, in fact. Okay, so first traveling through time, mm -hmm. then cybernetics, and also uh, corporate power, because it's cyberdyne, right? It's mm -hmm. like, like in Alien. In Alien, you realize that the, the, the commercial company, the, 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 the company is, is way more powerful than anything else. And actually, Lieutenant Replay in, um, oh, sorry, for a uh, British English, Lieutenant Replay, yeah. huh? <laughs> Lieutenant, um, is in fact, uh, in a way, more scared by the company uh, than by aliens, mm -hmm. uh, by the, uh, what's their name again? The aliens, the, uh, I forgot the name, you know, the, the, um, in English. Um, um, yeah, I forget the name. Yeah, well, anyway, she's, she's, <laughs> friend, she's more scared by, by the company than by them. And you, you also have that in Terminator. So, well, um, going back to, 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 to 2022, we had already um, a drone kill without any pilot. So, mm -hmm. so we had a drone, um, reportedly it's a Turkish drone, but mm -hmm. I'm quite sure it happened before with, with drones of other nations, uh, most probably American, uh, American drones. But mm -hmm. we have, at least historically speaking, because as you know, they would be used in, in um, black operations, mm -hmm. so it would not be any uh, official. But we had already one drone deciding to kill someone and it happened to be an innocent person. And according to Brown University, I think it's Brown or Rice University, I, I forgot which one, that made the count of the, of the casualties of, of drones in general, um, of collateral damage mm -hmm. of, of, mm -hmm. of drones, but with pilots. And uh, they concluded it was more than 65%, up to 75%, meaning three wow. freaking quarters. That's um, a lot. So now you would have drones that you just, you know, you just let them, let them go and uh, you tell them do whatever is necessary and they will kill people and it, it happens. And you also have that for industrial robots. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, you know, you also have 
cobots. Now, cobots, they are here to replicate your, your movements. They are here to, to imitate or to amplify a human-made movement. So mm -hmm. they're, they're co-workers in a way, co-robots. So they're called cobots. And they could kill you as well. Um, mm -hmm. They can be hacked. So, you know, back in the days, in the 90s, uh, there was a very popular hack when you had like a, a hard physical hard drive with a, a physical yep. reading pin, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you, you could just make the hard drive, the HDD, rotate mm -hmm. as fast as you wanted. And then you would, uh, you would put the reading pin on it and it would burn, it would, it would really toast mm -hmm. the, the drive. You would see smoke and everything. Yep. So it was like a physical hack of the... I mean, it, it's a, a digital hack of mm -hmm. your computer that has physical consequences. And you could do that as well for robots. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I, I forgot in which factory, but um, some, some really competent and scary hackers uh, were identified and they were trying to kill people in a factory by hacking those cobots. So you would have people being beheaded and, and, and all that. Oh. So it's not that dystopian at all. I mean, physically speaking, we could do it. Mm -hmm. So of course, we won't have the Cyberdyne T800 uh, being able to take so much... Uh, uh, punishment and, and, and to handle firearms. But, I mean, you know, you've seen that movie, maybe Chappie. Mm, with the Chappie, robots, yeah, yeah. 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 Neil uh, Blomkamp. And, and that's yeah. possible. A, a Chappie scenario is yeah. possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. quite. Do you think um, AI would inherit our bias? Because we we build it, actually. We it already it. does. So, um, we've seen quite a few situations like that uh, there was the the chatbot so chatbot supposedly is the lowest level of ai you can mm -hmm. have so just a, a kind of a bot robot that answers uh, your messages and um, you had microsoft launching a chatbot called tai mm -hmm. I, I mentioned it in the book and uh, tai was again essentially learning from from twitter which is probably a bad bad place to learn anything <laughs> but um of course before anybody knew, uh, Tai became like a really huge racist. And okay. uh, uh, you ended up having Tai saying, uh, answering because you're Mexican or whatever. And oh, wow. uh, that, they, they, that's they, bad. they had to pull the plug. Yeah. Because, um, okay, supposedly it was because some people on Twitter wanted to humor uh, mm -hmm. Tai a bit. But, well, I mean, this kind of humor was obviously quite, quite heavy. But the, the result was that Tai had to be pulled out uh, of Twitter. Uh, obviously, Apple would not do that because they never run a product. They never speak. They, they never even mention a product if they can't launch it massively. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they, they never do, you know, um, exhibits, uh, mm -hmm. conventions. They, they would never do that. But uh, Google does. They had it with the Google Glass. And, you know, it, it ended badly because people were called glassholes, mm -hmm. right? And um, then you had Microsoft having to pull the plug on Thai. So, so it already happens. Yeah, it, the worst of us can be soaked in, in the AI, yeah, uh, as well as better dimensions, of course. But yeah. mm -hmm. the, the worst of us can definitely be soaked in AI, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a little bit scary. <laughs> well, again, I mean, this is good that we see it early, right? Because the, yeah, the earlier true. we learn, the earlier we can correct it. So, as you know, the old motto of Silicon Valley was fail early, fail often. Mm -hmm. And so, well, failing early, well, of course, Apple doesn't want to fail publicly. And mm -hmm. that's the difference yeah. between Microsoft and them. And that's why Apple has the equivalent program as Thai, but they would not show it off. Mm -hmm. They have Siri that's working quite well. Not, you know, the, the, the range of Siri is not too, too large, mm -hmm. but... It doesn't fail. It, mm. I mean, it doesn't fail so epically as saying, uh, as answering because you're Mexican to people or whatever. And um, in the end, I mean, this is a kind of bias that we can see. Mm -hmm. But you've got other types of biases that, that when you discover them, it's too late, especially trading robots, trading algorithms. When, mm -hmm. when they, they would create so-called flash crashes mm -hmm. uh, on commodities, uh, mm -hmm. among others, and you had that on corn, I think, or I mean, wheat futures or uh, pork bellies, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, you could see two trading algorithms fighting each other to corner the market and uh, ending up co causing a flash crash. You had that also in cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is some kind, you know, this is um, a proto-ego in a way. Okay. It's, it's as if the AI had some kind of ego. Of course, it doesn't really. Mm -hmm. But the behavior looks like, you know, you had two coked up traders who didn't want to uh, to fold and uh, they were like playing some kind of game of chicken mm -hmm. on, on, on raw materials and uh, commodities. And uh, it ended like that, well, you had two AIs reproducing this behavior, even mm -hmm. though you could not say they have an ego, they were acting as if they had one. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Wow. But it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is scary <laughs> too. But scary. again, I mean, the, the earlier we know, the earlier we can correct it. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So you discuss human intelligence and how that is powerful. 
How do we uplift each other as a society? Again, that's another great question. Um, we had the Industrial Revolution tended to make us believe that machines were the ultimate ideal of productivity, mm -hmm. rigor, everything, right? A machine is, is predictable. And our educational system was, was heavily, if not totally, influenced by the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, even today, when you want to compliment someone, you say, oh, you, your brain's a computer, right? This, yeah, this, true. This is terrible to say, in fact, because our brain is way better than a computer. It's about 20 watts. Uh, which is nothing, right? The human body must be about 100 watts. Hmm? The, the, the human brain is uh, less than 1.4 kilos, so let's say three pounds. Mm -hmm. And um, those three pounds of uh, fat, essentially, because the human brain is essentially made of fat, uh, accounts for 20% of our mm -hmm. energy expenditures and is way, way better than a computer. Mm -hmm. So our brain's better than a computer, but our educational system and our way of thinking, taken from the Industrial Revolution again, has led us to, to believe that the more we would resemble machines, the better we would be. And um, this has led to this kind of anxiety that w what would be our relevance? And that's why, for example, Elon Musk, he, as smart as he is, believes that, well, we, we, we're going to fail. I mean, the mm -hmm. machines will, will beat us sooner or, let, or later, so we have to merge with them. And that's why we need um, microchips implanted in our brain. And this is inevitable. Uh, well, again, the whole point of my book and um, of my thought, if you will, mm -hmm. is that this is not the way. Uh, we, we are forced to become more human, to, to know ourselves better. And um, this is not an option, because mm -hmm. indeed, if we don't, we will really believe, we will really end up having a massive inferiority complex towards machines. And uh, your question is about that. How do we uplift? Exactly. How do we, mm -hmm. Because, yeah, if machines can do pretty much anything we value economically, well, mm -hmm. they can't do everything we value spiritually or philosophically, or even, even artistically, even though that could be discussed. Uh, but they can sure do anything that's productive and that's um, GDP relevant. Mm -hmm. Let, let's mm -hmm. put it this way. Mm -hmm. Anything that GDP relevant, it looks like, it might be an illusion, but it looks like machines are doing at least as well as, as, as we are in, in certain fields. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Deeper Blue, the uh, IBM uh, artificial yeah. intelligence beat Kari Gaspar of a chess in the yeah. 90s, mm -hmm. in the mid 90s, um, The Economist uh, ran an article that said, uh, if, your, if your job looks like chess, be ready to change your job. Uh, which is true. If mm -hmm. your job looks like chess, you should be ready to change your job because this is typically the kind of uh, service that AIs can provide in a better, more predictable way. But again, being standardized and predictable uh, were virtues of the Industrial Revolution. And, and British explorer Richard Francis Burton, you know, one of the persons for whom uh, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle invented the term uh, ge extraordinary gentleman. Mm -hmm. uh, Sir Richard Francis Burton, who spoke 29 languages, was a Sufi explorer and a, an honorary member of the Royal Geographical Society. He said, um, in the span of time, each virtue was considered a sin and each sin has worn the crown of virtue. Uh, so standardization, believing that human beings should be standardized in their thinking, in their behavior, is considered a virtue today, especially more so when we are reaching soon enough 10 billion people on planet Earth. But uh, this is again a sin rather than a virtue. So we, we really tend, I mean, when I, I met one, one day a shaman from, from Amazonia, and uh, what we considered okay, like having the Seine River, it was in Paris, having the Seine River so polluted mm -hmm. that you can't swim in it, for him was like an, an abominable sin, obviously. Uh, polluting a river uh, so much that you can't swim in it is an abominable sin. Well, for all Parisians, it's like so-so. So the notions of virtue and vice can be relative. I'm not arguing towards moral relativism in general, but we have to admit that in history, all periods of time, like the Romans with slavery, have thought that some, what we would call vice today, would be virtues. Well, my conclusion is that be believing that standardizing, making human being pr beings predictable, especially through the school system, uh, has been considered a virtue long enough. And we should really discard this way of thinking mm. if we want to survive the 21st century, because machines are way better than us at being standardized. What defines our identity? Again, that's a great question. <laughs> um, for, I mean, the Industrial Revolution has uh, made it so that we end up thinking that what defines our identity is productivity. Of course, the moment we say it, we realize it's, it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. But um, 
it's an unsaid perspective in a way. It's um, unofficial in mm -hmm. a way. Society rewards productivity above all. And this is a, a concept I created in my, in my books. I called it neurofascism. Mm -hmm. the, I define neurofascism as the society or the way of thinking that, that believes the brain is only good for three things, um, fun, productivity, or power. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is this English... Um, Uh, idiom, work hard, play hard. Yep. Um, or more than an idiom, it's an imperative, mm -hmm. right? It's an imperative. Work hard, play hard. You had it a lot in, in the 80s, but it's still here. Mm -hmm. And work hard, play hard is all about that, right? The brain, the human being is only good when it's having fun, I mean, enjoying, um, feeling pleasure. Mm -hmm. Or being productive. And uh, the third category, uh, again, category, sorry, is um, power. Because, uh, above all, you need some kind of ruling class above all the people who have fun and are productive. Because having fun is also a way of being productive for someone else. Mm -hmm. If you're having fun, somebody else is making money out of it. So that's great. Uh, and again... We, our society, we realize that it's not a philosophical statement that we can make and we, we can't defend it. Mm -hmm. But just society doesn't have to claim it. It just has to act. Mm -hmm. uh, in society, you realize that human beings are more and more reduced to those three categories. Again, pleasure, um, uh, pleasure productivity and power. And uh, the moment we say, the moment we discuss it, we realize it can be fixed and human beings are more important than their pleasure, productivity or power. So what defines us, I don't know yet, but I know what doesn't define us and I know what society brings too much emphasis on. Mm -hmm. Again, pleasure, productivity, power, those three Ps. Um, now, of course, fulfillment, uh, meditation, whatever, uh, finding what the Japanese call ikigai, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean it's completely different from pleasure and productivity because as a matter of fact if you found your raison d'être as right. they say in French mm -hmm. right and the ikigai in Japanese uh, if you found that the, the, the reason for your birth in a way um, you are being productive and happy at the same time so the first two P's are quite well mm -hmm. uh, fixed and uh, you don't really mind power anymore because if you're if you're fulfilled say you've become a great artist or baker or whatever um, what you don't really care about if you don't have a boss mm -hmm. ultimately or you will more rarely have a boss because you will be more independent so of course being independent is one way of being um, uh, if immune from mm -hmm. power plays and, and power structures independence is the best way to escape most power structures so if I claim that uh, human beings are not only uh, power productivity and pleasure then fulfillment raison d'être mm -hmm. could be what defines human beings ultimately Um, when you have an identity crisis, a simple question uh, can turn to a disaster. Who are you? Where are you from? Yeah. Uh, what do you think uh, parents, communities and governments should do in order to make them feel that they belong? Well, it, it would be um, about really making sure what's considered important in the educational system. So, so far, the educational system values productivity and standardization mm -hmm. or pre predictability. Predictability, which is one of the way of being productive in the industrial world. And um, fulfillment is not. I mean, it's, it's not that we don't care about fulfillment. We do. We, we can't administer it. Mm -hmm. So th there's no administration of fulfillment. And our society tends, by the way, it works. You know, uh, from Marx to Foucault, you have all this thinking that you should look at structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at structures, you realize a lot, because there are a lot of things that are not claimed, that are not said, that are not some kind of... Um, if you will, statements mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, values, as we like to say today, we have values. Well, you just look at the way the structure works and you realize what its real um, operational values are, even though they are not declared. Mm -hmm. And you see that the concrete values of, uh, of our system are predictability and, um, um, and productivity. So, again, this is not really um, what it wanted, but this is the end result. Mm -hmm. So... How do we manage to make fulfillment important? How do we manage to make sure that... Because again, I mean, if you want to be competitive, and, and there is this uh, permanent anxiety of, of being competitive, yep. of course, you see that the, the Chinese system where uh, kids are, are like pressured from their birth, uh, even before their birth now, because eugenics are, are becoming more and more interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, so there, there's this competition even before you conceive uh, for, you know, again, everything, uh, pretty much everything. 
Uh, how do we manage to, to make our children escape from that? Well, we can already tell them that if they are fulfilled, they're going to be more productive or more competitive because if they really like what they're doing, they're going to end up doing it better because they will give it more attention. They will pay more attention to detail. They will be more resilient in the sense that they will be able to persevere more. And a lot of great entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs mm -hmm. just said just as much. I mean, uh, Steve Jobs said, for example, if you, if you like what you do, what will happen concretely and we can really measure it is that you will persevere more because it's so hard that any rational person person would give up. It's Steve Jobs speaking mm -hmm. again. So teaching our children that um, in fact, uh, even productivity is like, productivity is a secretion. It's an end result. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a product. Productivity mm -hmm. is a product. It's a product of being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. It's a product of being passionate about what you're doing. And, and it will in fact bring you also happiness. And Again, a big lie of the Industrial Revolution was that you can't have productivity and fulfillment at the same time. Yep. Uh, it was that those two categories were actually um, uh, opposed most of the time. And, and, and most of the, you know, the, the, union, the debates about unions and uh, the age of retirement and, uh, had as a, as a basis the idea that you could not be productive and fulfill at the same time, which made total sense when you were talking about a coal mine, for mm -hmm. example. There's not really many ways that you could be productive and fulfilled in a coal mine, even though that could happen. But, well, that would just, you know, cut the margins it's of, the, rare, of yeah. the owner, right? That's not supposed to be the, uh, the norm. It's the yeah. exception. Yeah. But... In, in our world today, uh, and this is what machines could do, actually. They could push us towards forcing us towards mm -hmm. being more fulfilled and actually just focusing on uh, those lines of work where being fulfilled is not an option because you could just not be competitive if you didn't like the job or if you didn't like what, you, what you're doing. So, yeah, our society has to pivot towards that. Uh, putting fulfillment at the center, even though it cannot be administered, and again, it, this will create a kind of a anxiety for the uh, uh, politics mm -hmm. and uh, maybe even, even teachers, because what we cannot administer, how will we scale it? How will we create mm -hmm. you know, a whole educational system that will be nationwide? How could we make sure that fulfillment is the absolute pr priority of our educational system? Well, if we look towards the Scandinavians, mm -hmm. especially the Finns and uh, the, in Iceland as well, well, the Swiss as well in Singapore. This could give us a few lessons in the in that end. Yes, it's incredible. I mean, something else. Since you you, you are talking about the Scandinavian countries, mm. is uh, for instance, you can see, uh, yeah, for the paternity leave. Mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in Sweden, it's two but, years for for both parents. As you know, they, they have. Um, I mean, most Western nations now are, are in a demographic recession. Yeah. And uh, paternity leaves are a great way to to counter uh, demographic recessions. Uh, in Denmark as well, they. They could mutualize uh, time for homeschooling mm -hmm. because they, you know, Denmark didn't have much of a colonial empire. They had an empire back in the days in the mm -hmm. Middle Ages, but they didn't have much of a colonial empire. Well, I mean, if you accept Greenland, though, which was essentially, which is essentially a colony, but uh, countries that didn't have a colonial empire didn't feel compelled to politicize their education that much. Mm. France had to politicize their education because their education was um, essentially a, a unifier uh, of, of the nation. You had to say, you know, you, back in the days they were learning our ancestors, the Gauls. Yeah. Like if, if you were in Senegal, that didn't make much sense. Or if Algeria. You, yeah. Or Algeria, exactly. Or, or, or um, uh, Indochina. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so our ancestors, the Gauls. But th th those programs, as they are called, the programs, uh, which says a lot when you think about it, those programs were standardized centrally mm -hmm. in, in a pyramidal way because the another mission of, of the educational system was, of course, not fulfillment, but was the uh, national identity, the unification mm -hmm. of the national identity. And, and those countries that didn't have this burden, like, Swiss, like Switzerland or Denmark or, or, or Finland, um, they are very free, very much free to, to not politize their, politicize their education. Mm -hmm. And wh when they they pass a reform or try something, just they're even as free, um, free enough to, to try something. Mm -hmm. And Switzerland can do that because they don't even have a ministry of education. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the education is a cantonal uh, prerogative, meaning that oh, wow, okay. each, each, yeah, each canton can decide to try something and then they're completely free to admit they failed. You know, the, the, the first consequence of politicizing education is that you can't admit you failed. Mm -hmm. You can't admit that this way of doing is not working because mm -hmm. uh, you will be answering to your constituents, but you will be answering to the people voting for you and uh, you don't want that but those countries that can experiment well they end up seeing many many more ways of uh, uh, you know encouraging homeschooling they, they don't feel yep. threatened in France 
homeschooling is considered the devil because that would threaten the national identity. You know, there's mm -hmm. the l'école de la République we say in mm -hmm. French, like the school of the republic. It says really a lot, and uh, homeschooling is seen uh, as terrible. In, in, it's in, an institution, in actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's an institution. It's almost sacred in a way, yeah. and uh, it's a self-serving institution because it teaches it, uh, the next generation that it is a sacred institution. So it, it's implanting that that thinking, and of course, a sacred institution cannot much be uh, reformed or mm. even innovated within. So in Denmark, they have those um, cooperatives, if you will, where parents would mutualize time. Mm. And, uh, you know, to, to homeschool children, you need about 15 hours, a minimum of 15 hours per week. Uh, so if you just have three, three people or five people who are willing to give three hours, which is nothing, uh, per week, well, you can do it. And uh, they're encouraging that. And uh, this would be a great way to, to counter the demographic recession in, in uh in the West in general, but mm -hmm. also in Japan, as you know, Japan also has a terrible demographic recession. Oh yeah, yeah. it's un it's, un it's yeah, unbelievable. It's like it's <laughs> like scary in a way. Yeah, yeah. it is. Uh, since you talked about e education, uh, what what's I know you're an officer of marine, right? Yeah, navy. Yeah, French navy. navy officer, sorry, yeah, yeah, French navy. Yeah, French navy. Excuse me, I still think, I don't know why I still say it in, in French. Uh, what's your thoughts about the foreign legion? Because I, w I was born and grew up in Calvi, Corsica, mm -hmm. which we, we, ha we still have this... Uh, this you map. had this elite uh, yeah, foreign elite region. Foreign so the, the foreign region is, um, is a special uh, type of horse, if you will. It's a special breed of a horse. Um, it's sorry, I, I want to be a little sorry. more precise. What I Carry meant on. is... Uh, what do you think about as uh, what, what do you think about it as a system of assimilation? How how who do how do they um, welcome other other nationalities and uh, as to that end, it works extremely well. Uh, yeah. we, we can really see that. I mean, you you have a lot of heroes of the foreign region uh, who are like uh, warrant warrant officers. I don't know in, in British English how they would mm. say that, but warrant officer would be the equivalent in uh, in um, American English. Mm. And uh, yes, it worked. Uh, it's extremely harsh, and uh, of course, it's it's uh, it would be cancelled <laughs> to most. You know, you have to know that there is one particular battalion of the Foreign Legion that uh, uh, hosted quite a few uh, former members of the SS uh, d d right after World War II. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, okay. Well, that that that's one thing. I mean, they uh, in Indochina, uh, this uh, this particular battalion, uh, and even their marching their marching uh, anthem mm -hmm. uh, was actually an adaptation of uh, yeah. an, an SS yeah, uh, know, song. Yeah. So. You know, again, if we don't politicize the legion, uh, of course, it's not the case anymore today. The background check is way more thorough. Yeah, this, yeah. this this was, after all, more than uh, 70 years ago. But um, you could be a killer and be part of foreign legion. You could I not like, anymore. Uh, World yeah. War One, or I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah an, a murderer. Yeah, a murderer. Yeah, be a murderer and it'd be bad. But I mean, you could even be a former SS officer, yeah. which is quite scary. In a wow. Way. But uh, okay, the, the foreign legion indeed has this because there is a philosophical concept with the foreign legion, which is Français par le sang versé. So yes. being French not because of your blood, but because of the blood you spilled mm -hmm. and um, other countries had that I think you had this in a way not, it's not really institutionalized in the United States but you, it could happen mm -hmm. like you, for example you had think in the in the Green Berets, so the, the Army Special Forces in the United States, uh, the um, most heroic uh, character in the Green Berets was a sergeant. I see. I think maybe sergeant major. I don't know. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not addressing him by the by the rank appropriately, but he was at least a sergeant. Uh, Roy Benavides, A.K.A. Uh, that mean Mexican. Mm -hmm. Uh, who's like an absolute hero because he survived pretty much everything. He was put in a body bag and you know, it was like uh, Kill Bill. Uh, he had his guts falling wow. apart. He had an eye soaked in blood. He had like, uh, I think, 30, 30, 3, 0, not 13 uh, bullet wounds. And uh, when the the the, um, the the medic was uh, zipping his body bag, he spit in his face. Wow. And uh, the guy survived. He got the medal. <laughs> he got the medal of honor. And um, I think when he enrolled, he could he could barely speak English. So it was a little bit like the Foreign Legion in a mm -hmm. way. And uh, and this guy is an immigrant, but he's considered the single most courageous Green Beret to 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 ever be born. So we know that um, facing danger tends to make you more pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And obviously, a lot of uh, reservations that would be politically uh, defended mm -hmm. uh, by both sides of the L in the United States or in the British Parliament or in France. Mm -hmm. Uh, would just be uh, transcended by the war and say, of course, if you're fighting alongside us, uh, we will treat you differently. Uh, the Foreign Legion had this dimension for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, but again, it cannot be too um, it cannot be too exposed in the media because um, I'm being very honest. There, it would be cancelled otherwise. Oh wow! Okay. In 1769, Corsica became French, 
the year of Napoleon's birth. Yes. So the family Bonaparte was part of the Tuscan nobility. Napoleone di Bonaparte started to learn Fren French at the age of nine, mm -hmm. and until he died, he never uh, Spoke learned. Good, good yeah, French, yeah. yeah, he never learned to spell to, to spell properly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, uh, by some extremist standards, an immigrant became an emperor and embodies French culture and one of the most famous human beings in history. Uh, how long do you think it will take us to see European leaders from African or South Asian backgrounds? Do you think Sadiq Khans, you know, mm. the mayor of London, uh, double election is a good sign that we are going in that, in that direction? Uh, you know, I, I won't call anything good or bad, but we, we're just watching history. Um, the Roman Empire had a few Spanish emperors, mm -hmm. and it had an emperor that was called an Arab, mm -hmm. an Arab emperor. I forgot which one it was, but Hadrian was, was a Spaniard. So uh, the Roman Empire had that, and it worked really well. Some of the best empires, including, again, Hadrian, who was one of the best emperors, mm -hmm. uh, were not Romans, mm -hmm. in fact. And uh, regarding Napoleon, it's really interesting. First of all, the, the first name, Napoleon, comes from the uh, proto-German nebulas, which means, like, you know, nebulosity, like a cloud. Right? Yes, the nebula. Yeah, the yeah. nebula, right? Yeah. And uh, it, it came through Italy by the barbarian invasion. So it wasn't even an Italian first name. Mm -hmm. uh, it became an Italian first name uh, soon enough. But initially, the first person called Napoleon, I think, in the, in the record, in the registers in Italy, was a, a bishop. Okay. And... Um, then the whole history of Napoleon is fascinating indeed. First off, because the French tend to completely uh, mythologize Napoleon. Mm -hmm, yeah. Napoleon is a myth. There are many things that we, we, we don't want to face regarding mm -hmm. Napoleon. And first off, indeed, is that he didn't speak French without an accent all his yeah. life. He couldn't spell properly. That's correct. A lot of uh, rep reputable historians in France... Uh, really wrote that Napoleon could spell and write perfectly, and that was just a blatant lie. He couldn't. And uh, we, we see, when we see his real um, um, authentified correspondence, that he was making a lot of mistakes, and uh, he, his command of French was just not good. That is mm -hmm. correct. But again, if you say that to even like the French Académie Française, and uh, you, you, you mention that, you will be uh, spat upon, because this is considered like... Uh, I mean, Napoleon is almost um, a god in, in the French yeah, history. Yeah. So that's the first thing, indeed. Um, then, of course, Napoleon had a love-hate relationship towards France. This mm -hmm. is correct to say. In, in many uh, of his letters, he, he would say terrible things about France. He would say that uh, he would uh, screw her, in a way. Like, you know, there, there was a big um, controversy in France when a French rapper, I think it was Booba, mm -hmm. uh, who said he was... He would uh, screw France till she loves him, uh, something like that. And of course, that was, that was greatly controversial, and, and, and rightfully so. But Napoleon said just as much. And uh, uh, he didn't leave, and I mean, he didn't say it, he wrote it. And uh, this is uh, authenticated. And Napoleon even thought about serving uh, the Sultan of Turkey. So we have, oh, in, okay. the, yeah, in the military archives um, in France, we have uh, a letter um, allowing Napoleon to be uh, general for the, the Sultan of Turkey if he so wanted and it's an application he made so mm -hmm. Napoleon applied to the French army saying could I uh, if possible, serve the Sultan of Turkey. Mm -hmm. So Napoleon was absolutely not a patriot at all. At all. And it really hurts the patriots, especially the Corsicans, uh, to say that but Napoleon was not a patriot. And there's a, a figure in Corsica whom Napoleon betrayed repeatedly, and it's uh, Pascal Paoli. Yeah, right? yeah, of course. And Pascal Paoli was way more in advance than, than Napoleon on many fields, and uh, among others, he gave the right to vote to women. Yeah. So Pascal Paoli was Constitution extremely... Constitution as well. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. right? He was extremely progressive, and Napoleon betrayed him, betrayed him very much. And his father betrayed him and Napoleon betrayed him as well and he even wrote in a um, uh, it's a piece of essay that uh, Napoleon wrote it was called Le Souper de Beaucaire mm -hmm. so the uh, Beaucaire uh, dinner uh, in which he, he would really, really uh, write terribly of Pascal Paoli. Now, regarding the history of Napoleon, though, it, it's really fascinating in the sense that, as you know, Corsica was about to become independent no matter what. And, yeah. and the Republic of Genova could just not hold Corsica. So yeah. they decided that, uh, and this is extremely important because th this would domino into world history in a completely unpredictable way that had immense consequences. Uh, so... 
Corsica was about to break apart from, from the Genovese Republic no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Genovese Republic decided to, to sell Corsica yep. rather than losing mm -hmm. it, but it, it sold it at a low price. And uh, that's how Corsica ended up being in France. But then, of course, you had the same history uh, for Napoleon when he became the, the, the undisputed leader of France. He would sell uh, Louisiana. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> the reason he sold Louisiana is exactly the same than uh, Genova would sell Corsica. And Napoleon was very aware of it uh, because Napoleon had so many trouble, uh, troubles in um, uh, uh, San Domingo mm. and Haiti, right? Present day Haiti. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uprising, with, I think. Exactly, yeah. an uprising uh, with a very an, an excellent general Toussaint Louverture. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the controversy over Napoleon. I mean, I'm, I'm not only talking about what we would call today yeah. war crimes, mm -hmm. essentially with the Albanians at uh, uh, Saint Jean d'Ac. I forgot the name in English, but uh, Jaffa, right around Jaffa, mm -hmm. where, where Napoleon uh, murdered 500 Albanians who were prisoners wow. and were unarmed. This would be considered a war crime today, but at the time the standards were different. But another part of the Napoleon controversy would be the uh, re-establishment of slavery, mm -hmm. and of course to also please uh, is. Um, Financiers, in because mm. the, the coup, the, the coup that Napoleon made and the, in which he took power, was backed by bankers who wanted a return on investment. But uh, let's put that aside. Regarding uh, Santo Domingo. Uh, Napoleon realized that such a small island could uh, cause him so much trouble and so he of course uh, reasoned that uh, Louisiana which was uh, from New Orleans Baton Rouge all the way to, mm -hmm. to, to the basin of Missouri and Mississippi and uh, all the way to Canada yeah Montreal uh, uh, Quebec exactly. now, well yeah. Montreal was not part of Louisiana but yeah, true. New France Yeah, it had been lost already Quebec had been lost during the Seven Years War but Louisiana the Louisiana Purchase which would have such an impact on world history because it would turn the United States into the superpower they were. Otherwise, they would never have become a superpower in the first place because they are a superpower, essentially, because they can go from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, Abraham Lincoln would say uh, not, uh, not even all the armies of Africa could take a drink of the, uh, in the Ohio River, which is true. Not even all the armies of Asia, Africa, and Europe combined could take a drink in the Ohio River. That very much defines um, the particularity of the U.S. geography. But anyway, Napoleon would do that because of the Corsica purchase. Mm. So the, there is really this trickle-down effect, if you will, this um, domino effect, this butterfly effect in, in world history regarding Napoleon. Now, regarding, again, the... Um, assimilation mm. now. Uh, it is true that empires have always ended up, if if they want to survive, they have to be meritocratic. Mm -hmm. So if you're meritocratic, at some point you will have uh, an exonymous leader, if you were an exotic leader. You will have a leader uh, coming from somewhere. Even, you know, Winston Churchill, you, mm. know, you have to remember that he was half American. Yeah. His mother was American. So th th these things happen, but Winston Churchill at the same time was very, very much assimilated. Right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the question of so much so that the question of assimilation would not even be posed. It's because uh, his father was a noble and uh, again Churchill had like uh, uh, this he, he had this uh, John Bull attitude mm -hmm. um, that that would not that would make questioning his assimilation ridiculous uh, and again rightfully so of course with Napoleon it was different because his command of French was not that good and you could not say that Napoleon was an eloquent mm. speaker of French whereas of course Winston Churchill was one of the most eloquent Britons uh, to ever be born yeah. so Regarding empires, uh, we tend to see that a lot. And it's when, when empires resist meritocracy, meritocracy usually, that they tend to collapse. And the, the French colonial empire could have adopted such a strategy, but Charles de Gaulle was not ready for that. And he, he said it really clearly. He said, uh, if uh, we decided to give, say, French citizenship to all the Algerians, and yeah. you have to remember that Algeria was a French department. So yeah, it, yeah, was, yeah. it was like part of the national territory. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. not a protectorate. It was not a colony, uh, legally speaking. Of course, yeah. it was a colony de facto, yeah, yeah. but legally speaking, it wasn't, uh, which allowed France to uh, veto uh, pretty much anything at the UN and not call the war in Algeria a war. It called it like an uh, order uh, keeping, yeah. uh, you know, peacekeeping operations. Uh, De Gaulle was not ready for that. And uh, he, he really clearly said, if we did that, my village, uh, which is called yeah. uh, Colombe les deux églises, so Colombe the two churches, would be called Colombe the two mosques. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, the French people were not ready for that. There, there could have been many ways of handling the Algerian case. It could have been like Scotland, you know, with a particular yeah. parliament. Mm -hmm. and many, many things could have been done if we had been more innovative, uh, politically speaking. But most of the time, empires are not ready for that. And I mean, we can't really blame France because Japan is way, way, way worse. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you could... Yeah, Japan, as you know, there's a museum in Japan where you can't even access certain areas. I, I, it's, it's in Kyoto, I think. 
uh, because those areas uh, contain archaeological evidence of the Japanese dynasty being of Korean origin, yeah. w- which of course it is, right? <laughs> yeah, it I is. mean, they didn't just you know fall from the sky, even though the emperor is called Celestial, celestial Emperor. But even though actually the new constitution doesn't make the emperor a god anymore, right? Before uh, the, the defeat yeah. in, uh, in 45, the emperor was nominally, legally a god, mm-hmm. uh, but now he's not anymore. But still, right, it's quite important to the history of Japan. Yeah, and as yeah. you know, some uh, hardline Japanese Japanese nationalists would never be ready to admit that, genetically speaking, uh, their uh, ruling family yeah. is in fact uh, of Korean origin. So uh, I'm quite sure France would have um, leaders of uh, uh, different cultures. I'm quite sure this would happen even uh, in the general election, so at the parliament or as uh, the president of France. I'm quite sure it could happen. You just check Belgium, right? Belgium, which is supposed to be even less tolerant than, mm. than France. And uh, they have like a huge uh, Moroccan diaspora. True. There are a lot of Moroccan elected officials in Belgium. So uh, I don't think this is an issue. But um, the real issue is to understand, again, the raison d'être of the nation. Mm -hmm. What is the nation for? Uh, What should be the purpose of the nation? And the the greatest politician of all times, in my opinion, Abraham Lincoln, put it very clearly when he he, he pronounced, when he he spoke the Gettysburg Address, where he really put in a very few words, in a three-minute speech, the the raison d'être of the United States, Mm -hmm. even though they betrayed it so often, the raison d'être of, of the United States was the government of the people by the people for the people. And it was, you know, he, he, that's beautiful. The uh, Gettysburg Address is, is almost, it's political poetry because it starts with the initial raison d'être of the mm. United States. That we conceive this nation in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Mm-hmm. That's so simple, yeah. right? so simple, so clear. And it gives you the raison d'être of the nation. And he ends it by another raison d'être, which is the government of the people by the people for the people. When a nation has that, they should never fear uh, the, 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 the complexion of their leaders, mm-hmm. never. But when they don't, uh, then they should fear it, yeah. With your knowledge of geopolitics, uh, what, what do you consider the difference between expatriate and immigrant? Oh, that's, an, that's an excellent question. Uh, you, you can see it from the uh, economic perspective, mm-hmm. right? So a lot of expats would, would send money back to the country. And uh, so many countries could balance their budgets thanks to the money that was sent back by the... So in that case, you would call them immigrants. That's true. Yeah. Mm. So uh, when they... Usually when they would... Uh, uh, you know, you could see them as a tr- some kind of trade balance, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the fear would be that you would call them immigrants if they're uh, taking money out of your country and uh, sending it back to their country. And you would call them expats if they're actually spending their money in your country. <laughs> I think most of the time this is, if you look at it at the, you know, uh, cold-blooded economic perspective, you would see it this way. Uh, now, of course, it's all about social classes, right? Mm-hmm. You would call, most of the time, you would call immigrants people of lower social classes. Yeah, and you would course. not call them immigrants anymore. Look, take the case of Marie Curie, for example, yep. right? Of course, Marie Curie would not be called an expat in, in France still, but she would just be called French, because after all, she took a French last name when she married, and she brought two Nobel Prizes uh, to France, and uh, even more so with, uh, obtained by a woman, mm-hmm. which is qu- quite amazing. And uh, well, she was Polish, she was a Pole, and uh, had she been, I don't know, uh, working in... Um, you know, works or like being a blue collar worker, she mm-hmm. would have been called entirely differently. That's correct. And uh, Leonardo da Vinci would not have been called an immigrant uh, either. So I, I just think the economic perspective of saying, look, if they bring, if they send more money uh, to their uh, to their country uh, than they spend in your country, you would most of the time the press and uh, even economic analysts would call them immigrants rather than expats. Yeah, yeah true. It's like if my my father immigrated from Tunisia hmm. to France. He's an immigrant. Yeah. I immigrated to the UK. Uh, I'm an, an expat, expat absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, th- this is the contrast actually. So there are some countries in uh, Europe where you can't, as a Muslim, get buried because there is no Muslim square in the cemetery. For instance, many French Muslims from African backgrounds will almost automatically get sent to their country of origin to get buried knowing that most of the time they almost never set, f- set foot in their parents' country. Who do you think is to blame here? The community, the local council, or it, both? It's, it's really both, yeah, because um, you take the case of Richard Francis Burton. Of course, it was in another time, but it, it's quite funny because Sir Richard Francis Burton, who was Muslim, mm-hmm. he, was a, he was converted to Sufism, uh, he's buried in the uh, suburbs of... Uh, London called Mortlake mm-hmm. and you can visit his grave it's quite beautiful it's a uh, it's a Bedouin tent 
it's a it's a Bedouin tale mm -hmm. carved in stone uh, on which you see the cross and the crescent uh, that's uh, quite unique so of course it's in a Catholic plot because his wife was Catholic uh, mm -hmm. Elizabeth Arundel Lady Burton but Elizabeth Arundel née Arundel and uh, of course she was buried in a Catholic plot so um, he, deci he decided to consecrate the ground in a way by having this uh, sculpture of a Bedouin tent with the cross because again this is in a Catholic cemetery but there's also the crescent and um, in fact it's quite easy for a Muslim. I don't think it should be an issue because for, for a Muslim, it's very easy to consecrate, uh, to consecrate a plot of land. I think the, uh, of all the three Abrahamic religions, uh, consecration of ground for the Muslims is the easiest. Yeah, true. Uh, you, you, know, you just have to say a few prayers on the, on the soil and that's it. Uh, so you could, from a Muslim perspective, you could consecrate uh, any tomb anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, uh, this is theoretical, right? Yeah. This is, uh, you know, in, in practice, it's way more complicated. But I could see lack of tolerance on both sides. I travel to Senegal quite often. And uh, uh, of course, I'm considered white for them, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously, I'm not black. But um, I wanted to visit a, a graveyard in St. Louis in Senegal. And um, some guy f didn't want me to enter because he, he thought I could not be Muslim because I was not black. Oh, wow. Yeah, right, okay. so I had to explain, look, <laughs> I mean, it's funny because in France, people think I could just not be a Christian, for example. Yeah. As a matter of fact, my mother is a Christian. But um, yeah, so you see, this is a different kind of perspective. So he didn't even want me to desecrate the, 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 the Muslim cemetery by entering in it. Wow, he was yeah. not sure I was a Muslim myself. So uh, this kind of intolerance, you would see it pretty much everywhere. And uh, no Nowhere in Islam is it said that um, a non-Muslim uh, is forbidden uh, to, to enter a, uh, a, a Muslim, Muslim cemetery. Se yeah, it's yeah. It, okay. In some countries, it's some kind of tradition. In a way, it's a tradition, yeah, true. like the idea of a mosque and all that. You know, I, I've been in churches so many times, and I have to admit that Christians are extremely tolerant. We can't we can't put that against them. They let Muslim people enter yeah, churches uh, pretty much every day. Uh, in a lot of Muslim countries, you just can't do that. If you're a Christian, you won't be allowed oh, yeah. to enter the mosque, even though some mosques are just works of art and they are as open museums. They are open to visit that's mm -hmm, true mm -hmm. but they are the exception they're not the rules where in, yep. in Europe most if not all cathedrals are open to the public atheists Jews Muslims and all that so regarding plots of course, um, politicians have a, a responsibility, but the community could make it very easy to solve the problem. Uh, of course. They, they, you know, they could just uh, pass a few laws or just a few practices, even publish manuals, say, well, this is what you should do if you want to. And that would be so simple. You would bring an imam or you would... Th th this is not hard to do. For a Jewish plot, it's, it's harder. But for a, a Muslim plot, it's, I, I really am I'm positive of all the three Abrahamic religion. Consec the consecration of ground in the Muslim case is the easiest. Mm -hmm. uh, so th th to me, this is a non-problem in the sense that it is a, it is a problem because it yeah, happens. It is. Uh, but it could be fixed so easily that I don't really understand why it hasn't been fixed already. Yeah. Mm, I lost a childhood friend. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, yeah, we, I was 13, he was 18. He never set a foot in Tunisia. And he had to be back. To and be he, back. Yeah. But was he a French national? Yeah, he's he French. Was. So what happened exactly? So actually, where we grew up, mm -hmm. there is no Muslim squares. Yeah, but you don't need a full square. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But again, in my opinion, I agree with you. It's, yeah. it's, uh, um, the problem is coming from both yeah. the community and the government, because the community could have said, yeah, you know, we need... <laughs> we need. Oh, you mean they had to bury him in a Catholic plot? No, they sent, they sent him back. Uh, to Tunisia. But they, if they had buried him in France, say, imagine yeah. they did that. Uh, what's wrong about just calling an imam to pray on the tomb and making it de facto Muslim consecrated ground? This is the community issue yeah. that they don't want to do that because for, because for them it's easier and cheaper. So basically, okay, well that's a money yes, problem. Yeah, then exactly. it's not a religious problem. Ah, no, 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 it's not about but religion. As you know, it's in Islam, you can consecrate ground even if you're not an imam because yeah, there's true. no there's of no course. clergy. So if you just had a few people pray on his tomb, exactly, yeah, but if yeah. you do want, want to make it uh, a Official, you could have the tombstone being a crescent, and yeah. uh, you just put a, a big fat crescent on the tombstone, and you wouldn't have even this kind of problem there if you're afraid of uh, the area be, being treated in, an, in uh, another way. And that, that would be it. I mean, nobody forces the tomb to have a cross. For example, as you know, in the Middle Ages, you would be forced to have a cross yeah, on your tomb. And that, that would upset many Muslims. But uh, this is not the case anymore, right? Because yeah, uh, So, okay, it was more in that case of a money issue, issue than... Uh, it's, a, for me, again, it's, 
I don't say I don't want to say this. I don't want to say it's laziness, but ah, okay. it's wow. for me. It was easier for the rights to be of course to be made in of course in Tunisia but because the Tunisian government is paying for it. It's paying ah, okay, for everything. Well, okay. So for but, me, but again, it, the rights of a Muslim burials are the sorry are the cheapest. It's true. I mean, you're yeah. not even to, supposed to be buried in a casket in the first place. You're supposed to yeah. be buried in a shroud. Of course, it's a it's a illegal now. I think being buried mm, in a yeah, shroud, so it, which doesn't make any sense. But it's true that human bodies now, unfortunately, carry a lot of heavy metals and uh, uh, coffins and, and uh, caskets make them uh, you know disperse and percolate in the ground uh, less but mm. still I mean normally a Muslim should be buried in a, in a shroud yeah. uh, in a very small plot as small as possible as modestly as possible and you could do that anywhere yeah you exactly know? I mean again for me it's it's a problem because uh, how do, how can you feel a connection with a country if yeah, you can't never been yeah well but in that many, case I yeah. think his parents are slightly more responsible Everyone. It's okay. not. I have to, in my in my opinion, it's everyone because, of course, it's parents it right. took the decision to send him ba mm. send them back. Where? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, not, yeah, it's yeah. not even from there. But you know, I, it's been a it's been a, a whole political statement there because uh, you had the I think the grandmother of the king of Morocco mm -hmm. uh, who's buried in that very cemetery I wanted to visit in Senegal, uh, mm -hmm. the Saint Louis. I think okay. it's his grandmother or great grandmother. I okay. forgot. You know, there are many links between Morocco and Senegal. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But there's also the fact that the the tomb of Emir Abdel Kader was yeah. uh, repatriated created in Algeria against his will he wanted to be buried in Damascus where he saved so many Christians mm -hmm. as you know there was an uprising and a, yep. there was a massacre of Christians and, and uh, Emir Abdel Kader who was very prestigious for his uh, resistance against mm -hmm. the French uh, hosted took on him to um, defend uh, some 600 Christians which he saved and for that he was awarded the French Legion of Honor and he was even uh, given two um, pistols by Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. and there's even a city in, in the United States called El Kader on, on the Turkey River in Iowa. Oh, wow. El Kader, yeah. It was funded by Christians, by, by conservative Christians. And the mayor today, I, I, I had the honor of meeting him. The mayor is a conservative Christian who voted for Trump and he still traveled to Algeria to honor Emir Abdel Kader. But you see, in, in that case, He's, uh, he was very much Algerian. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He didn't want to be buried in Algeria. He made it quite clear. He wanted to be buried next to his master, Ibn Arabi, uh, spiritual master in Damascus. Mm -hmm. Well, still, the Algerian authorities took his grave and brought it back to, uh, to uh, Algeria because he's a national hero. Yeah, he's the Napoleon of Algeria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was quite controversial, not for the politicians, of course, but for the historians and for the uh, Syrians as well, because mm -hmm. after all, it was uh, as if, you know, the Italians would repatriate uh, uh, Da Vinci's tomb yeah. uh, from France and Da Vinci's tomb uh, is, happens to be next to where Emir Abdel Kader was uh, held prisoner in France for, for some years in Amboise so yeah you know tombs tend to be political even yeah. if they're not um, the tombs of historical figures yeah. they always tend to have some kind of uh, political uh, taint mm -hmm. and um, uh, far writers uh, in France could could use that to say look uh, this uh, this young man was uh, uh, buried in in Tunisia so it shows he was not French because uh, when the ultimate uh, uh, situation happened uh, he would rather be buried in in Tunisia which shows that he was what they would call uh, what they would call a paper French which yeah, uh, exactly so yeah. you see there's always this kind of political uh, dimension which is uh, most unwelcome in, in matters of life and death. Yeah. Uh, we are both European from different backgrounds, or French, we are both friends from different backgrounds. Uh, do you think we are represented, in, represented enough in the entertainment and culture industries? Well, to be honest, in the entertainment, I think this, is, this has become a non-subject. You look at, uh, of course, you, you could be... Uh, you could be arguing that in the French case, it's a little bit of a ghetto. I mean, if you're um, uh, French North African, uh, yeah. as I am, okay, my mother is Italian, my father is Algerian, but uh, my, my complexion makes it, and my name, my first name, Idris. Mm -hmm. Even though actually I'm named Idris after, uh, after an Englishman, in fact, yeah, yeah, right? Idris, because it's Idris Shah, <laughs> Idris and, uh, Shah yeah. he was an Englishman. But uh, indeed, people would more see the Algerian rather than the Italian in, in, in my complexion and appearance, and even demeanor in a way. Uh, but... Uh, the ghetto effect is that if I want to see um, uh, French Algerian people, I would I can look up to. Uh, they would be football players. Mm -hmm. They would be rappers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not so many would be famous scientists, even though they are. I mean, uh, you check in the case of Egypt, for example, you had ha Ahmed Zewail, who I, I think studied in the in, in um, uh, Great Britain, mm -hmm. and he got the Nobel Prize yeah, for yeah. his work on femtochemistry. So uh, what I would deplore, what I would regret, is that the figures a young uh, French-African, if you will, uh, can look up to 
even though they exist in the media, I speak, right? yeah. like in Netflix series or whatever, French-speaking Netflix series, yeah, so yeah, we yeah. could call that French mm -hmm. entertainment, or French music, mm -hmm. whatever, would most of the time be of the same uh, industries, yeah. rap, sports, yeah. or whatever. In the, in the United States and the United Kingdom, it would be very yeah. much different. It's true. Uh, so that's the thing I, I quite not like. But I would not say we feel underrepresented. I mean, again, look at Japan, look at China, look at uh, Southeast yeah, Asia, where like <laughs> this is just unimaginable to have uh, a, a top figure in the in the Japanese media who would be uh, Filipino or or whatever. Yeah, I know. I know Americans. Sorry to interrupt you. I know Americans who were born and grew up in Japan and speak mm. Japanese, and her, her they're not considered Japanese. Yeah, they're not considered Jap Japanese, which Absolutely, is yeah. it's uh, um, yeah well, you, you could, in France. You could make a spectrum of the countries that value the blood above uh, anything yeah. else and the Japan would be at the end of the spectrum, no doubt. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> in Western movies, a good Indian is a dead Indian. Muslims in cinema are either uh, visible or villainized. The Mauritanian is the most positive Muslim character portrayed uh, I have seen in a while. Last time I can think of uh, as a positive character was uh, Salahuddin Ayubi in mm. uh, Kingdom of Heaven Absolutely. by Ridley Scott. Or Muhammad Ali in Muhammad Ali, sorry, in Ali by Michael Mann. Yeah, uh, is the portrayal of Muslim Muslim changing? It is um, in the eighties. So it's it's interesting that you said a good Indian is a dead Indian. It was, of course, you're talking about Native Americans, exactly, not of Indians course. of uh, yeah. the Republic of India. But um, the that was in the times of John Wayne, right? And yeah. you know there were many protests, even mm -hmm. Marlon Brando. Uh, declined the Oscar yeah, for, for, for The Godfather and he decided to have, I think, uh, Sashim Little Clouds yeah, it was yeah, the yeah. name. And uh, it completely aggravated John Wayne, yeah, was yeah. about to uh, kill her if he had not been restrained, uh, to protest against the representation, the stereotypical yeah. uh, stereotypical representation of uh, Native Americans in, in American cinema. So in the 80s, you had more modern movies like Dancing with the Wolves. Dance mm -hmm. with the Wolves? I don't know uh, the name in English. Dance, dance with the Wolves. Dance with, or not dancing, okay. So you had that. I think you, had, so. you had the last of the Mohicans as well. You had yep. Geronimo. Yep. So you had a lot of uh, more open-minded movies that would also happen to be more uh, historically accurate. Mm -hmm. And the, the Indians ended up being uh, very well, very positively represented. Uh, I think you, you would not even represent uh, Indians in a negative uh, way uh, in most American movies. Now it's become the norm. You, you have some that are represented in a, in a bad way, uh, which is still historically accurate in the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Yep. Right? So you have some scenes where you would see the, the Comanche. Right? Mm -hmm. The Comanche were, of course, like uh, they, they were gangsters. They were yep. not really, they didn't have traditions. They, the Comanche were essentially young Indians left uh, loose that created some kind of gangster culture, if you could uh, put it this way. Sort they, of they, lonely wolves or something. Exactly, yeah. but they were like extremely violent and they would be the, the, the scariest to, to the Europeans and especially to the Spaniards, uh, mm -hmm. of whom they cut the expansion uh, northward. So now, uh, the Arabs became the, the, the villains, uh, yeah. especially in the 80s, right? You remember there was even um, a uh, wrestling character, uh, what was his name? He was the enemy of uh, Hulk Hogan in uh, the, the World Wrestling Federation. Uh, uh, the Iron Shear, the oh, Iron Shear. Yeah. Right? So yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, an yeah. Iranian, uh, Iranian bad guy, yeah, a yeah, stereotypical yeah. Mm -hmm. bad guy, and uh, of course Hulk Hogan would beat him, and that that was this whole uh, mise en scène, right, mm -hmm. about uh, the good guys. And so the, the, the new, the, the Indians of the 50s would be the Arab, that's yeah. true. And uh, for so many reasons, you had the uh, Iran-Iraq war, you had the, of course, for most Americans, the, the, the subtle difference between uh, Persians and Arabs would, oh, be, would be lost. So, um, <laughs> or the, Indians the guy, Or Indians, right? Yeah. The, the guy with the turban would be the bad guy, yeah, the guy exactly. with, the, with the camel would be a bad guy. And you had the, the first Gulf War, then you had 9-11, mm -hmm. so... And uh, you had also the Carter Doctrine. So the Carter Doctrine uh, stated that, uh, provided that uh, the United States should consider any uh, interference in their oil supplies in the Middle East mm -hmm. uh, almost an act of war, so they should control the Middle East, which they very much did, as much as they could for the next uh, three or four decades. So this uh, created an atmosphere where Arabs had, had to be represented in a uh, negatively st in stereotype. Mm -hmm. But you had a few exceptions that, uh, when I was a young boy, really impressed me, because I, I could see that. I mean, I could see that video games would represent Arabs. Oh, yeah. By the way, you had, in, in Command and Conquer, Red Alert, so very 
very, very good uh, video game. Command and Conquer Red Alert 1, Command and Conquer Red Alert 2. Now in Red Alert 2, you had the Iraqian Devastator. Now the Ira Iraqian Devastator was, of course, an awful man using a um, radioactive uh, gun, and he would be able to deny a whole area by making it radioactive, and he had like this horrible, stereoty stereotypical mm -hmm. Arabic accent. And I would play this game, and uh, I knew it was like really fucked up and racist. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and if they're talking about ca canceling pretty much everything, they should cancel that. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like Tintin or whatever. But okay, uh, you had a few exceptions. You said uh, Saladin in uh, Kingdom of yeah. Heaven by Sir Ridley Scott, no yeah. less. Uh, you had also Robin Hood um, yeah, with, uh, with uh, Kevin Costner yeah, and yeah. with Morgan Freeman, yeah, who had like an yeah. amazingly positive Muslim That's there true, yeah. who would practice medicine, who would be cleaner than the others. You had also uh, the 13th Warrior, I think yeah, that's the name, yeah, right? Yeah, with the, uh, uh, Banderas. Antonio yeah. Banderas. Yeah. So uh, they made those those few exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, you, al you also had uh, the, the Animatrix. So you're, you're talking to someone who really recorded that. You had some <laughs> scenes in the Animatrix where uh, you would see Muslims um, praying before yeah. before they would fight robots and they would uh, they would be courageous warriors fighting the robots and they would they would pray just before they fight because they know they will die heroically mm -hmm. uh, in the um, in the um, camping on the side of humanity yeah, right yeah, yeah. so even though some it's funny some um uh, interpretations of, of the Matrix was uh, that uh, it represented the three religions uh, and Muslims would be represented in a bad way because of course the home of, of humans uh, in the Matrix is called Zion. Right? Yeah, so this yeah. would represent the, the Jews and especially yeah. more so when you consider that Neo means the one. Yeah. Uh, so he's the Messiah and the Neo is with Trinity so obviously she represents Christians. So True. then if you would ask by elimination who's representing Muslims <laughs> that would be the machines right? Exactly. Trying to besiege <laughs> Zion and all that. But uh, you know again growing in that period that was which I survived right culturally speaking growing in that period which was the most um, Islamophobic uh, yeah, of, uh, pretty much <laughs> the last uh, 100 years uh, well uh, I survived and I, I also valued all those movies that would represent Muslims in a positive way I think this is starting uh, now to be um, irreversible and that, that Muslims would be more and more represented positively in movies yeah I mean not talking about Schwarzenegger and True Lies and all that no <laughs> I really like the scene actually of Salahuddin picking up, you know, the cross. Yeah, uh, and exactly. Then, yeah, yeah, that's uh, and yeah, also offering sherbet and ice. To yeah, the, uh, yeah, all that. paying respect to to Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, this is an amazing scene. Um, cinema, arts, and literature are very specific to identity and background. Mm -hmm. What if Terminator was directed by Scorsese, <laughs> or? Apocalypse Now by Spike Lee? <laughs> to what extent the individual shapes? The culture. Um, okay, if, if Apocalypse Now had been directed by Spike Lee, I think it would just not have happened because, uh, <laughs> as you know, Apocalypse Now was uh, pretty much apocalyptic in the in the making yeah, as true. well. Oh, and, uh, wow, yeah, yeah. Uh, Martin Scorsese almost lost his house. He had mortgaged uh, his house to... Um, no, sorry, uh, Francis uh, Ford Coppola. Coppola yeah, yeah, Francis yeah. Ford Coppola, my bad. No, Francis no. Ford Coppola had mortgaged his house. Uh, you know as well that Marlon Brando was overweight and didn't oh, wow, know his yeah. lines. Uh, so actually, it they kept ended him, up... Sorry to interrupt you. They kept him only for the second half half of the movie exactly because, yeah. he, <laughs> because he was overweight and yeah, of course yeah. they paid him a million a week so yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I mean expensive. they paid him a million a week and Francis Ford Coppola had mortgaged his house so he was under intense pressure yeah, his, yeah. Uh, his marriage was uh, uh, almost killed mm -hmm. by this movie and I think, again, I have a lot of respect for Spike Lee, but had he directed that movie, it would just not have happened because you <laughs> yeah, needed true. someone uh, for whom it was the baby in a way. Now, if uh, Terminator had been made by, by Martin Scorsese, I think Martin Scorsese, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, never made any science fiction movie. Uh, uh, Hugo? Hugo Cabaret is not really it's science not a, fiction. Yeah, it's not right? really it's science fiction. Yeah, some true. sort of steampunk. If you really want to call it science fiction. No, it's not. It's, not, it's not, not even there steampunk, isn't, right? There yeah. isn't. Yeah, there isn't. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, Shutter Island is more psychological movie. No, right, it, I, did, yeah. I don't see any, any sci-fi exactly. sci so movie. So you could say Christopher Nolan. Right? Oh, yeah, so so Christopher Nolan could have, um, could have made Terminator. Yeah. In which case, I think the uh, editing would have been bad, to be honest. Uh, because <laughs> the, uh, you know, uh, term, even Terminator, there's an obsession with Christopher of a Nolan with time. Right? Yeah. His first movie was Memento and uh, you have this scene in Memento that you would see in Tenet as well where you yeah. see the, the bullet returning to the yeah. gun, right? Yeah, this, yeah. this is already in Memento uh, which I think he made with some 50,000 pounds or something else, 50,000 yeah, yeah, yeah. dollars. And... Um, 
It would have been completely different, but in the end, I think it would not have been such a good movie. Uh, but it is true, of course, that the, uh, you know, back in the days, uh, Daryl Zanuck, uh, mm-hmm. all that, they, Daryl Zanuck and also um, uh, David O. Selznick, right, mm-hmm. for um, Gone with the Wind. Back in the days, the studio, the, the, the producer, would be the most important figure in the movie, and, and they could switch uh, yep. directors because there was some kind of... Um, you know, just as in, in British English, you have the received pronunciation. Well, you, has the, you had the received directing as well. You had the, some, some way, some standardized way of directing that mm. was clear and that was reproducible for most people. Of course, you had uh, already a few lone artists with a, a very particular way of directing, mm-hmm. uh, like Fritz Lang yeah. or Lenny Riefenstahl or all that to, to quote these people. But, uh, or even Jean Renoir, right, who had a very, very particular way of directing. Or Julien de, Duvivier, yep. who, whom I admire a lot and who was completely copied, of course, for Al that mm-hmm. became the inspiration of Casablanca. So back in those days, you could really switch directors easily. But then, uh, post World War II, you would really start having like directors showing. Uh, of course, it's, some would say it started really with uh, uh, Orson Welles. Right? Yeah, true. Uh, yeah. But uh, and, uh, but also, you know, you could say you could argue that uh, you had those big big five. I forgot all the name, but you had John Huston and uh, Frank Capra and uh, all those people who served in the war. Yeah, uh, and who who ended up being enrolled in the U.S. Army and uh, and uh, John Huston and Frank Capra and um, uh, ah and. Uh, Ah, the super famous the John Wayne director, the guy who directed uh, John Wayne the most. I forget, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Ford, Ford. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ford. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's three out of five. Right? John Huston, Frank Capra, Ford. Um, and they already had a very particular mm. way of filming that, that, that would make them stand out. But also you had this way of acting that would make uh, some directors be um, quite attached to some, some yeah. actors. Uh, you know, we, we uh, can see that with Nolan, for instance. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. With Nolan, but also for Scorsese, right? Yeah, uh, yeah true, uh, With true, uh, yeah. initially uh, Harvey, Niro, Harvey Keitel Harvey and, Keitel, and uh, then De, Niro, De Niro, right? then, uh, And then Leonardo DiCaprio, DiCaprio yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, but, you know, in, um, initially, for example, uh, Humphrey Bogart, God, would call method actors he would call them these uh, uh, scratch my ass and mumble actors yeah. he, would, he, he didn't like them much because he was from this tradition that you should deliver your lines in the clearest possible mm-hmm. way and uh, the diction of uh, Rod Steiger or the diction of Marlon Brando was mm-hmm. considered terrible uh, if, you, if you look at um, the diction of uh, great Shakespearean actors mm-hmm. uh, of the times, they would, of course, think that, you know, you could not have Marlon Brando play Shakespeare, <laughs> play no. any, any Shakespeare yeah, play, yeah. With the, first with his accent and with his particular <laughs> diction. So, yes, uh, it's really with the, especially you were right to ask the question about the 80s, right, Apocalypse Now and, uh, and um, Spike Lee, yeah. because in the 80s, really, you could just not uh, change the director like that. It, it happened in some movies, uh, in some blockbusters even, yeah. but uh, most of the time, if you did that, it would go ter- horribly wrong. Yes. <laughs> uh, when we look at propaganda, do you think we are less victims of it than we used to be, when, w- than we used to be with easier access to information? I think we are way, way more victim to propaganda today because ah, okay. we, yeah, there's peer pressure. So with, with the, the era of social networks and you see the cancel culture, take the case yeah. of J.K. Rowling, for example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, she was canceled because uh, she, she made it very clear and personal that she didn't want to call women, people women straight. So yeah. um, she, you know, because just in case a person woman straight doesn't identify as a woman, mm-hmm. well, that would not be yeah. inclusive enough. But okay, J.K. Rowling had an opinion that was a legitimate right and uh, she made it. Now, of course, you could argue that this is also the legitimate right of people to just uh, be upset at her. Okay, but look at how many actors have uh, attacked her that actually owe all their career to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, Emma Watson, Daniel yeah, Radcliffe, true, true. Rupert Green, pretty much everybody. <laughs> they so won't they, exist without her. Exactly, except the bad guy, the, the guy who played Lucius Malfoy. I forgot oh, his name. G- really good actor, yeah, excellent yeah, yeah. actor. Uh, he didn't want, and he made it very courageously clear that uh, he didn't want to cancel uh, J.K. Rowling, that she was responsible, of course, for what she wrote, but that he didn't want to, to, mm-hmm. to spit on her. Uh, but you see how exceptional he was, how unique he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is terrible and um, this is a sh- this shows you the power of peer pressure today you have to to signal virtue way more you have to be uh, to be permanently v- virtue signaling and uh, uh, of course, it happened during the First World War and the Second World War. You had to show on which side you were. And you already had the same thing, like, you know, when the French were against the war in Iraq, the Americans yeah. renamed the French mm-hmm. Fries the Freedom Fries. Yeah, well, you true. had that as well. With <laughs> the, uh, in, in World War I, uh, sauerkraut was called Freedom Cabbage. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, it yeah. already happened. But I think this has become those uh, riot effects, those... Uh, 
uh, mob effects uh, have become more significant today even. So even though we have this uh, illusion of uh, uh, individuality and uh, uh, free, free speech, mm -hmm. peer pressure has become uh, more oppressive today. Yeah. What is cheaper, peace or war? Definitely peace. Like, this is a no-brainer. War is uh, usually not cheap socially. I mean, there's so okay. many countries, you take the, there are the great lectures of uh, Henri Guillemin, an amazing French historian, who explains you that the reason so many governments were eager to, to go in, into World War I, of course, uh, being delusional, delusional enough to believe they could control it, war is a fire, you can't control it. You know when you light it, you don't know when you extinguish it. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no case in history that... Uh, uh, an emperor or a leader could know exactly where uh, a war would end. And World War I is uh, the perfect example of a war gone horribly wrong mm -hmm, where they mm -hmm. were supposed to, to have it for only six months. But the idea that you could just have this war for six months and uh, solve so many social issues with, um, uh, you know, the Marxists and all mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. uh, showed you that for some people, war would be socially cheap, right? And you had even thinkers who said, look, war is great because it uh, controls population mm -hmm. and it uh, makes our population stronger to some kind of uh, natural selection and all, all this bull crap. But um, in history, war is the most expensive endeavor of, human, of humankind. I mean, uh, war is the single largest consumer of cash mm -hmm. in, in, in any time, in any situation. The, the word, the word soldier comes from the uh, solidus uh, the, the the coin that was uh, made by the um, by a roman emperor mm. so a soldier was someone who had a sold in french right we would call it salt mm -hmm. with his pay but his mm. pay was made in a solidus otherwise you would call it a salary because it was paid in salt right salary okay. comes from salt yeah, you were, soldiers was were paid in salt but the soldier was uh, a soldier because he received a solidus mm. which was a gold coin you know in english you say solid gold right yes. uh, so it was a solidus and mm -hmm. the, the reason you say solid gold is because of the Latin influence in, in Great Britain. Uh, so uh, war is the single uh, largest consumer of cash. And uh, the reason you had uh, World War II was because World War I pretty much bankrupted uh, all of Europe. And it could bankrupt Europe because we had the, um, the freedom to print so many bills. Mm -hmm. Hence the hyperinflation that would become uh, impossible to solve in the Weimar Republic uh, mm -hmm. soon after because the Weimar Republic could just not repay its war debt. But the reason in the first place that World War I lasted for so long was because it had uh, it, it, we used um, this strategy of printing money so mm. much. And the Romans did it as well. They, they clipped coins, for example. So you would, they would confiscate your coins and they would clip a bit of it to, to, to take back some uh, precious metals. And then this would devalue your coins, of course. And then they would put more alloys. Uh, the coins would not be solidus anymore. Mm. They, would be, um, they, they would have alloys. And so uh, devaluation was the best way to finance a war. So war is really... And there's not a single counterexample to that in history. The single, the, the, the single most expensive endeavor of humankind, uh, when we're talking about mega projects, say mm -hmm. uh, dams or um, the, the freeways, the, the, the super highways of uh, uh, President Eisenhower, mm -hmm. who cost, I think, the American taxpayers some uh, four hundred billion dollars, wow. uh, which at the time was, uh, you know, and we're talking about dollars of, of 50, 52, 55. Yes, huge. Uh, so that's huge, yes. And uh, still, that's nothing compared to war. Uh, the uh, Pentagon budget today is mm -hmm. 700, 750, 750 uh, billion dollars, mm -hmm. billion dollars wow. each year. Now, for a fraction of that, wow. you, you could eradicate world hunger, you could eradicate illiteracy, you could eradicate malnutrition, you could eradicate most, most uh, vaccinable viruses. So, um, indeed, uh, we, we, war is the single most uh, uh, sacrificial in a way uh, mm -hmm. endeavor of human beings because also it, it tends to sacrifice uh, human ingenuity as well mm -hmm. the best inventors and this is again what uh, President Eisenhower said in his uh, PC, uh, sorry uh, military industrial mm -hmm. complex uh, peace industrial complex is an invention of mine but um, in terms of uh, concept if mm -hmm. you will that I said that I, argue, I argued in many essays that we should have a peace industrial complex uh, funding mega projects of the size of war but that would actually prevent war so yes definitely peace is a uh, is productive peace doesn't peace creates cash to, to 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 summarize the answer to your question peace creates cash and war burns it well that's yes incredible i did not i did not know that war was <laughs> yeah, it is in history it's there's really no no a situation no example where more cash was burnt wow. than by wars yeah um last question <laughs> war destroys families and homes we should we should not have to say immigrants life from africa 
uh, matters as much as that uh, of a white European. What do you think about the media coverage of the war in Ukraine? Well, as you know, it is often said that the first victim of war is truth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it was even the Daily Telegraph uh, that said that acknowledged that some fake news had been uh, had been spread about Ukraine on the Western side, not on the Russian side, which is normal there at war. But uh, for example, the Snake Island. So there was this idea that on Snake Island you had some people who resisted heroically, which would been uh, amazing. But mm -hmm. in fact, they did not. It was pure fabrication just to to boost morale, which is Okay, I mean, when, when you're at war, you have to do that, and it, Ukraine is completely justified in doing so. Uh, us are less justified in uh, not uh, criticizing or analyzing this, even though we're allies. Of course, if we're allies, you could say, look, we have to defend Ukraine. And so some journal, I think it was the Daily Telegraph, but I'm not sure, you mm -hmm. have to check, mm -hmm. to check it out, uh, really made it clear. They said, yeah, we know we spread fake news, and we're still journalists, we still know how to do our job, and we still know how to confirm or, or invalidate a piece of news. Uh, but we, we think that this is good for Ukraine that we uh, we spread fake news. Uh, this is very debatable, obviously, because the, normally a journal should be independent and it's not a state yeah, journal. Course. What I'm sure yeah, is yeah. that even if it's not the Daily Telegraph, I'm completely positive it wasn't a state journal. Now, if it had been a state journal, you could comprise, you could understand it as some some sort of uh, policy, mm -hmm. right? some kind of policy that, yes, we will uh, defend Ukraine in their psychological warfare, uh, which includes, of course, spreading fake news. And the Russians would do the same because wars do just that all the time. Uh, but no, of course, citizens should be informed in a neutral way uh, as, as much as possible. And this is not the case in the war at, at the moment. So I've lived in Ukraine. I've lived in Ukraine for one year. Mm -hmm. And I've got, at the moment we're recording, I still have uh, friends in the city of Chernihiv. Uh, so Chernihiv is in Ukrainian. Chernigov would mm -hmm. be in Russian. Uh, not far from Chernobyl, from Pri Pripyat, mm -hmm. uh, where, where you've got the uh, Chernobyl power plant. And they're living in their basement. So I cannot be nu neutral about Ukraine, even though I, I made a live uh, session on my uh, YouTube channel mm -hmm. where I, I uh, gave my opinion on the conflict and the coverage and I tried to be as neutral as I could mm -hmm. but um, it, I have to, dis to disclose that uh, obviously for mm -hmm. a matter as a matter of transparency uh, still I have to admit that being quite knowledgeable in propaganda te te techniques and having studied them, some of them for my PhD, uh, you have to admit that obviously propaganda is at, um, is at work, especially in the, the way we uh, minimize uh, the, the presence of neo-Nazi group in, in, mm. in Ukraine, which, yeah. which they are. Of course, you could say there are some neo-Nazis on the Russian side as well. That's true, but not in the army. They're more in the Wagner group, like the mm -hmm. CEO of the Wagner group is a na Nazi admirer, uh, completely openly, even has some uh, na Nazi tattoos, Nazi-themed tattoos. But in Ukraine, they're integrated in the armed forces. And uh, uh, this poses problems. You also have the fact that they named an avenue Stepan Bandera. Now, Stepan Bandera was a terrible person. You can't yeah. call him a hero. Uh, but after all, in this cancel... Th wh what I really find funny, though, is that people who would be ready to cancel Churchill statues, yeah. who wanted to, to destroy uh, uh, Sir, Sir Winston Churchill statues, and Sir, Winst Sir Winston Churchill is considered, again, rightfully so, the greatest Britain to ever live. Yeah. Um, well, why, why would they not cancel Stepan Bandera, right? So you could see that there is some kind of uh, mob psychology there. Yeah. Uh, you want to control the crowd as much as you can through mm. uh, gut feelings, to irrational behaviors. And this, of course, is not conducible to the truth at all. Thank you very much, Idris. Uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, you coming here. And thank you very much for your time. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope to see you soon. See you soon. Hopefully, you. whenever you want. Really, it was a pleasure. <laughs> all pleasure was mine. So for everyone, for all French speakers, I really recommend this book. It's very, very valuable. Thank yeah, you. Very otherwise, much. On, on YouTube, you got the um, uh, the conference, uh, how to train your brain. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, that had been subtitled in English, uh, and uh, it, it's not in English. It's not delivered in English, but it's subtitled in English, and it made some nine million views. So it, uh, wow, there were there were a lot of English speaking viewers. You have some essays in your re website, right? Yes, right. So they they're more like technical essays so one is on uh, that were, that were translated in English Chinese and Korean one was on the knowledge economy and uh, the other one on the knowledge geopolitic that's called Nu'u politic right Nu'u okay. is from the Greek Nu'u that means the mind and already I was explaining that was the subject of my PhD uh, how uh, knowledge how innovation could transcend some conflicts make them irrelevant because mm. most conflicts are uh, based on the fact that material resources are null sum in their exchanges meaning that if I get some territory or some natural resource you will get less because mm -hmm. When they are shared, they are divided. But knowledge, when knowledge is shared, it's not divided. It's in fact multiplied. Mm -hmm. And in some situation, knowledge could actually transcend conflicts. And that's uh, one area of geopolitics that I'm fascinated with. So you can find that in my uh, on my website. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Uh, we'll link your website on, on our uh, video description. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.